So welcome to the Broad Art Tell Me More Diverse Voices webinar. We're so excited. We have four wonderful authors today. Um, one, it's his first book and it uh, published yesterday. It's Chaz, we're so excited for you. And we have some New York Times bestseller and bestseller authors. Uh, and we have Gwen Vanderhead is going to be our moderator. Gwen has 18 years of experience with children and teen and, um, books within the library business. She's worked from Virginia to Colorado in different libraries. And we were so lucky to have Gwen as our collection development for the children and teen side of Broad Art Company. So Gwen, over to you. Hi, welcome everybody. We're so glad you could join us today. Um, we're gonna jump right into talking to our group of authors. And what you'll find us doing today is we're going to talk to each of them individually. And then at the end, we'll go ahead and ask a few questions of everyone in a roundtable format. Um, if you viewers have any questions, you can feel free to put those um, in the Q&A and we will get to them if we have time. The first author we're going to talk to today is Marty Chan. Marty Chan is a Canadian author who lives in Alberta and has written several books for teens. Um, and he has a presentation for us. Um, so Marty, please take it away. Great. Thank you, Gwen. And uh, I'll, I'll ask Alanita to stop sharing so that uh, I can show you what I've got uh, for all of you. Uh, so thanks for that introduction, Gwen. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing what all the authors have to say, because personally, I'm looking to add to my collection of books to read this fall. And uh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that uh, Final Cut, my new book, will be something that you'll want to add to your collection. Uh, but I'm the kind of person who likes to show and tell. So I, I, I thought I'd show you the book cover while I talk about it as soon as I uh, as soon as I figure out where I put it. I know I left it here somewhere just before. So hold on just a second while I try to figure out where it is. Uh, okay, I know the book is here someplace. Uh, well, if I can't find the physical book, uh, let me do the next best thing. This is a hologram collection of all the books I've written. It's a little digital library of mine. And let me see if I can adjust the end. Ah, there we go. Okay. All right. And let's bring up the book. All right. Uh, whoops. Okay. Let's, let's try it again. Uh, uh, hold on here. Hold on here. Uh, uh, okay. Hold on. There we go. There is my book, Final Cut. But it seems a little small. So you know what? Let's, uh, let's bring it to life. And there we have it, Final Cut, my new book. Now, let me tell you what the book is about. See this guy right over here? It's not me. It's actually a guy named Mason who is a huge fan of horror movies. Now, he loves the old movies from the 80s, like Friday the 13th featuring Jason. And not only does he like watching the movies, but he also likes to make his own. So... Mason has his own YouTube channel with at least 10 viewers where he posts uh, or uploads uh, short horror movies that he makes at school. Now, unfortunately, Mason gets on the pointy end of some criticism when he uploads a movie of a couple of bullies. Now, these bullies have been tormenting Mason all through the school year, and he captures one of the encounters on his camera. And what he does is he, with a little bit of editing work and some voiceover magic, he makes the bullies look like fools. And when he uploads the video to his channel, it goes viral. Well, as viral as it can in his school. Unfortunately, the bullies get um, get wind of this video and Mason winds up uh, living in his own real life horror movie as he realizes that the bullies want to, well, let him know what they think of his movie. And uh, what proceeds from there is a life and death chase as Mason desperately tries to get home before the bullies get their hands on him. So uh, that is a little bit about what the uh, book Final Cut is all about. And I, I know everybody's got a bully story, and the book is actually inspired by my own personal bully story. I grew up in Canada in a small town called Morinville, where our family was the only Chinese family in the entire town. And there was a bully. Uh, let's just say his name was Rene. Uh, and uh, just in case he's watching, in which case I'm in trouble all over again. Um, 
Anyway, Renee's house was between the school and my parents' grocery store where I went home for lunch every day. And I would constantly have to find detours to avoid Renee. And of course, sometimes I'd guess right and sometimes I'd guess wrong. And when I guessed wrong, Renee would track me down and basically make my life uh, just a living torment. Now, one day... Uh, Renee was chasing after me. I think I got just really tired and fed up and I came to a screeching halt and bent over getting ready to sort of turtle up and get pummeled. Now, I didn't know that he was right behind me and he actually crashed into me and just sort of flew over me like I just had thrown him over in a judo class. Now, for about half a day, I thought I can take on bullies. Unfortunately, bullies have friends and I spent the rest of the school year trying to hide out not just from Renee, but his buddies as well. Uh, so that's sort of the personal inspiration behind my novel, uh, Final Cut, which is a really fun book for striving readers. It's short, it's sweet, lots of action in it. And um, it's one of those books that uh, is great for kids who don't like reading, but love action adventure. And uh, it's definitely worth uh, just taking a look at and giving a little, a little read of it. All right. So that's a little bit about what the book is about. I know I think Gwen now has some questions for me i'll do my best to try to answer them all right thanks marty um so you have written several novels for teens and kids and they span genres from realistic to the occult can you tell us a little bit about your writing process and where you get your ideas yeah, I have an incredibly short attention span. So, so I basically, I play around with ideas. A lot of my early books uh, were inspired by personal experiences, like the uh, Marty Chan mystery series were inspired by my childhood experiences growing up in a small town. Uh, with um, my steampunk fantasy series, the Eric Weiss Chronicles, uh, when I was a kid, I was a huge fan of stage magic. So Harry Houdini was my hero. And naturally, when I started writing books, I got I thought at some point I'm going to find a book and write about Harry Houdini. So a, a lot of my creative process is about, you know, stuff that happened to me or stuff that I'm interested in, which is, uh, you know, you spend all that time working on a book. You want to do something that you actually know and care about. Right. Definitely. Um, so some of your novels are written in the high interest, low reading level um, category kind of format that's a little bit different from some of the other novels that we're talking about. Is there a different process that you use when you're writing the high-low books from writing other novels? Uh, when you're tackling high-low, I think there is a danger sometimes that authors think, oh, it's kids who don't have the same vocabulary reading level as other children or other kids, so I've got to write down to them. And, and while you have to lower the vocabulary, you don't lower the uh, subject matter, right? There's still you know, 14, 15, 16 year old readers. So they care about the things that other 14, 15, 60 year olds care about. And I always think, write a story that engages that particular group and then figure out the kind of vocabulary that you would use to tell that story. Uh, so I think the the process is the same. And then what happens is in the revision process, you start thinking about that readership and trying to lower the vocabulary by keeping the interest high. That's great. I've always wondered about that. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that all of our books have in common um, is an aspect where the main character is kind of the underdog at the beginning of the story and feels misunderstood. Um, but then throughout the, the story arc comes to find that other characters um, that he has had, he or she has had misconceptions about them. And that's one of the things I like about your book. How did you go about crafting the relationships in your book? Uh, the, the, well, I'm, I'm a huge fan. <laughs> I always love underdog stories. So, so I think I was shaped early on in my uh, childhood by uh, uh, two movies, uh, Rocky and The Karate Kid. And, and I always thought, you know, I put myself in the shoes of The Karate Kid uh, and, uh, and Rocky. And I kept thinking, you know, I think every kid sort of puts themselves in that role of underdog. And so that sort of helped me shape the characters in a lot of my books with the underdogs. Is oftentimes when you're a kid, you always feel like an underdog because you're under either under the thumb of your parents, your guardians, your teachers, or your older siblings. Uh, and uh, so I think kids naturally feel like underdogs and that's why they gravitate uh, to those kind of stories. Great, thank you so much. So we'll come back to you. Um... 
at the end and talk a little bit more after Great. the next authors. Thanks, Gwen. Thank you. All right, next up we have David Barclay Moore who um, is the author of Holler of the Fireflies. This is his newest book for middle grade. Um, his first middle grade novel won a Coretta Scott King Award, um, The Stars Beneath Their Feet. And this one is um, just as rich. And so we're excited to hear a little bit about it. Well, thank you, Gwen, and Elanita as well for you know, hosting this and doing such a great job. Uh, and before I start, I have to tell Marty that I, th I think I was listening to a story about the bully. And I think uh, Canada has to be one of the few places where the neighborhood bully would be called Renee. I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which tickled me. But any, anywho, um, yeah, so Hollow of the Fireflies, it's a very special book for me. Um, you know, so there's a, a lot of themes in it that run throughout it. Uh, I think the kind of central theme is that of friendship that runs throughout it. Uh, and I think particularly because uh, a lot of this, um, a lot of the elements of this novel were drawn from kind of my own life experiences as a child growing up. Uh, so, um, you know, just to give you a, a brief Kind of idea of the premise is uh, my protagonist is a young 12 year old boy named Javari who lives in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And uh, Bushwick is a, a quickly gentrifying neighborhood. It's already heavily gentrified, particularly over the last 10 years, it's been heavily gentrified. Um, and so we see a lot of the effects of that at the beginning of the novel and throughout of how that gentrification is affecting um, Javari's kind of lower income family in that neighborhood. So there's a lot of stressors. There's actually some police brutality that happens at the beginning of the novel and towards the end of the novel as well that um, basically kind of encourages Javari to kind of travel elsewhere for a few weeks during the summer. And he basically goes to a STEM camp in Appalachia. So in a very small rural town up in the mountains in West Virginia. So it's very, the story is very fish out of water. And it's also uh, very STEM based, you know, and there's a lot of the kind of science and math. He's a, he's a, a math whiz. And so uh, a lot of the kind of science and technology and coding is kind of interwoven throughout the story as long as, as, as well as, um, him kind of being in culture shock and getting to know the, the local people and finding out that uh, even though Brooklyn is very different from West Virginia, there are a lot of things that are the same uh, and different in, and in good ways and bad ways. And so that's kind of a big learning uh, experience for him throughout the, the story. Um, so yeah, uh, themes that run throughout it are themes of kind of classism, racism, uh, social justice issues. Uh, a really big theme that runs throughout it, runs throughout the novel is that of corporate greed and how that affects our environment. That's a really big part of it. Um, and um, and as I had mentioned too, the whole thing about friendship and 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 whatnot. And even though I'm from born and raised in the Midwest. Um, I uh, have relatives in Appalachia, visited that Appalachia as a, as a child. And, and so a lot of those kind of experiences and memories are kind of infused into this story because uh, in some ways it's kind of a love letter to the people of Appalachia, right? And so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna read just a very brief part from uh, the novel. Uh, this is during a, a coding class that uh, Javari is having uh, at the STEM camp. And so he's basically with a bunch of other kids and they're going over a, um, a lesson on tablet, on a tablet computer. And this is told in Javari's, it's first person, Javari is a narrator. The whole group watched me and my tablet. I didn't really like the attention. I pressed my function button and my little night jar program began. It started with some hip hop music I found on the internet, an animated version of Earth spun into view in outer space. My Earth had a smiley face. 
And then my nightjar avatar, a bird, flew over the planet and dropped a chunk of coal into the Earth's mouth. The planet swallowed the coal. Another bird flew over and fed another chunk of coal. And another bird, another, and even more birds until my Earth got sick and breathed fire, flames. My birds circled around it, and that was it, the end. I looked at Mr. Wang, who grinned at me, clapping. So that's a very brief uh, uh, excerpt from Howler of the Fireflies. And uh, I read that because it's, there's, there's a lot of stuff packed into the novel, but that, I thought that little excerpt kind of indicates kind of how a lot of the STEM stuff and some of the more educational aspects of the, of the story are kind of interwoven to relate to some of the themes like corporate greed and, and whatnot. So, uh, and with that, I'm gonna stop and uh, I guess field some, a few questions from Gwen, and then we'll have a chat a little later on. Thank you. Great, thank you for reading from your book. Um, so as you're mentioning, you cover kind of a lot of STEM topics in your book. Is there a particular STEM topic that you're most interested in that you brought into the book? Um, I'm, I'm like a create, I was a, a, a creative writing major in college. <laughs> right. And I loved social studies and literature and reading. And I really despised math as a child, hated it. And it was, I, I mainly hated it because I, I, I wasn't very good at it. You know, as, as I got older in college, and I got a tutor, a math tutor, I actually discovered that uh, I could be very good at it if I just had one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which is, you know, I didn't have as, as a child. But uh, as far as the technological aspect, of the story that I, I'm most interested in, uh, having done a lot of research on math, because you know, I'm not my sister's a math whiz, I'm not. But it's probably there's a, uh, a thing I did not mention is there's a whole theme of a virtual reality environment that the kids play, and it's actually designed by a character that we've met before, and it's something else that I've written. Uh, and uh, so, I really enjoyed those virtual reality scenes, writing those because it's very interactive and, and immersive, and the kids are kind of become a part of this whole different world, but the world in the computer program that they're playing reflects a lot of the issues that they're going through in their real lives. Right, it's, it's very cool. So you kind of hinted at this just now, which is my next question. Um, we meet up with an older Lolly from your first novel. Uh, yes. Were you planning from the beginning to bring Lolly in or did that just kind of happen organically while you were writing? Yeah, it just kind of happened organically. Um, you know, it's funny because the whole notion of the virtual reality game uh, that I mentioned was originally an idea for a, a whole complete middle grade novel, right? And so I had this idea, I have gazillions of ideas for books and stories and things. And one of them was actually to just write a, an entire novel that just specifically focused on a virtual reality game, right? Um, I you know, didn't use that idea for a whole novel, but a lot of the virtual reality narrative is interwoven into this book, you know, it's mm -hmm. to kind of complement the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so once I did that, I thought like, well, I do have Lolly who created, created his own game made out of Legos in the stars beneath our feet. So I thought it would be fun to kind of catch up with him a few years and he's a teenager now and see what he's been up to. And so that's why, that's how he, popped up into this very briefly in this novel. Yeah, yeah, it's always fun for readers to, to meet the characters again. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, so there are some different styles of dialect um, yeah. and slang that the different characters use. How did you um, kind of research or come up with that when you were developing your characters? Yeah, a lot of research. Um, you know, I love language, you know, like in the, in the uh, the afterword to the stars beneath our feet, I talk a lot about language and how it's, um, you know, very, uh, it's important for us to listen to people. And so I just kind of innately, I'm a listener, you know, and I love languages, I love words, I love different types of speaking. And so for me, it was a challenge to be able to integrate in all these different types of um, accents and dialects, you know, from a very urban type of kind of African American, uh, um, language, Af African-American English, to uh, the kind of more rural um, uh, Appalachian dialects, you know, 
Uh, and even within that, there are different dialects, you know, um, of people who are more, more kind of hill people who are into that. Someone who comes from kind of Charlotte, uh, Charlottesville, which is like a different kind of area, you know. And so a lot of it was just kind of experience and research. And I had a lot of fun, you know, a lot of fun doing that. Yeah, that's great. All right, I have one last question for you before we oh. need to move on. So you are a filmmaker as well yes. as an author. Um, this isn't your first middle grade novel, but what made you want to try writing for a middle grade audience? It's so different from, from the things that you do when you're a filmmaker. Yeah, well, I guess I'm kind of a big kid, you know. <laughs> I, uh, you know, and I do have plans for like some adult fiction and I've, I've written some adult fiction and uh, I have a, a, a short story collection I'm working on that's adult. Uh, but I love doing it all, you know, um, screenplays. I've written a screenplay for The Stars Beneath Their Feet, which is in development. Um, I love comic books. I grew up reading tons and tons of comics. Uh, and uh, I love really, really good um middle grade fiction and YA fiction. I think there's something very pure about it that can be different from other genres that I really appreciate. And, you know, I think it's also for such a kind of underserved types of communities that usually don't see themselves in, in middle grade fiction. Um, you know, I consider it kind of an honor really to be able to kind of, you know, service that community as well. Cause I know I didn't have as much of it of that when I was growing up. Great, thank you so much. Well, thank you. So we'll come back to David at the end. Um, and next up, we have Chaz Hayden, whose very first book was just officially published yesterday. So happy book birthday. Um, thank you. Chaz lives in Pennsylvania. Um, and yeah, this is his first novel. So we have so lots of questions about, about how you've begun. Um, but go ahead and tell us a little bit about your book. Yeah, so hey everyone. Uh, yeah, my book was published yesterday. It was just super wild. Um, my debut was just unbelievable excitement. Um, so it is about a 15 year old boy named Harris who has a disability called spinal muscular atrophy. And that's actually the same disability I have. Um, and he rides around this really awesome uh, wheelchair. Uh, but the story starts off with his family moving from California to New Jersey. And Harris is kind of taking this as an opportunity to reinvent himself, um, just kind of being known as more than just the kid in the wheelchair. Uh, but he's kind of stuck on knowing everyone's favorite color. He thinks that by knowing someone's favorite color, he can judge them and know their personality the same way he thinks that people judge him just by seeing his wheelchair. So it's kind of like this little um, simple sort of, uh, you know, hidden way of judgment, you know, the, and it's kind of his way of, level the play, of leveling the playing field. Um, along the way, he'll make some friends, he'll make, he'll make some really bad decisions, um, and he'll find a new nurse to attend high school with him, besides his mom, because like, who would want your mom to be in high school with you, no one. Um, her name is Miranda. She's a nursing student. She's like this perfect blend of orange and red in a house's mind, which is the complement to his blue. And, but she's kind of dealing with her own problems. Um, so we're really not sure if Miranda is helping or hurting Harris along his journey of uh, self-identity. But it's a really fun dynamic that they have. Great. Thanks. So like you, um, Harris lives with SMA. Mm. How did you incorporate elements from your own experiences into his character? Like, how are you, yeah. maybe how are you the same? How are you different? <laughs> <laughs> I know, uh, when I started writing this, um, I wanted to write a book that had a character that had SMA. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want like disability, I didn't want it to be a disability story, like for it to be a disability centric story. Like I felt like if inequality and different barriers like that were at like the front of my mind, then like it would be a very angry story. And uh, Harris is not an angry character and I'm not an angry person. Um, but the obstacles that he deals with are the same obstacles that I deal with on, a, on like just, it's just woven into my everyday life. Like, um, 
you know, uh, different medical uh, treatments I have to do during the day, um, how Harris navigates being an independent student at his new high school with technology and uh, from, with his teachers. Like um, going on a date, uh, Harris can't feed himself. So he goes on a date with his crush and like, how does he ask her to feed him? Like how does he even approach this? So like a lot of his anxieties are like regular teenage anxieties of like just being out with someone you like, but also uh, disability. And there's sort of, there, there was never like one or the other, like the balance was just a part of him, just like it's a part of me. It's my everyday life of, of living with that. So um, there are certain scenes, you know, that were inspired by true events in my life, but um, sort of twisted in a way to make them more universally relatable and and that anyone can empathize disabled or, or not. Yeah, yeah, he definitely, he's a fun character. Um, all of your characters are will, really well-rounded, um, especially Harris, because he has the nerdier qualities, like all of his football expertise, which obviously, mm -hmm. you know, you share, um, uh -huh. and, and his humor. Um, there's quite a bit of football talk in the novel, and the sports angle really balances the social aspects. Yeah. Um, can you tell us how you built all these well-rounded characters? Did you have a process that you've been working on? <laughs> Uh, no, I just, I tend to live in my head a lot. I'm um, just constantly having conversations with myself. Um, I don't know if I should admit that out loud. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I've met so many people along the way in my life. I'm 26 years old. So, you know, 26 years of different nurses I've met, different doctors, different friends, different family. And all of them have kind of taught me something. All of them have inspired me, um, stayed in my life, didn't stay in my life. Um, so all those relationships were kind of, you know, mold, molded together to form the different characters. Um, they're kind of a mixture of a bunch of people I know, people I wish I knew um, that were in my life. I, I, you know, a lot of people ask me like, well, is, is this story based on your life? I'm like, I think it's kind of how I wish my life would have been, honestly. Um, you know, when I was a teenager, I'm like almost vicariously living through Harris in certain points. But yeah, the characters were just fun to write. And thank you so much for saying that because like secondary characters deserve just as much attention as like your main protagonist. Um, you know, without that, a lot of stories fall flat. So yeah, thank you so much for saying yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. What's your favorite color? Oh man, uh, I like blue, just like Harris. Uh, my wheelchair is blue. The house I live in is blue. Uh, my bedroom walls are painted blue. Um, so yeah, you have to read the book to find out what that means. But it's so interesting. Like uh, it was something I had never thought about. And now all my friends are like, "Do you judge us based on our favorite?" I'm like, "No, no, I've I've literally never done that." Um, but as I was doing research for the book, and then I would like find out, you know, people's favorite colors just randomly. And I was like, you know what, there is something to this. Like, I don't know, maybe it's a, it's not a science, but it's a, it's definitely kind of really interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this is your first book just released yesterday. How long have you been writing and do you have some other projects that are in the works right now? Uh, I do. I've been writing when I graduated college in 2015. I didn't have a job for a whole year, um, much like many other students who just recently graduated. Um, so I spent a lot of time reading all YA because that's like the only genre, in my opinion. Um, and I was like, you know what? Like, I think I could do this. I don't know why. I was a finance major in college. I'd never written anything ever creatively, like just for fun sometimes. So I started writing like poems and short stories, um, going to critique and feedback uh, meetups and groups and just kind of reading a lot and honing my craft, um, getting better at it, reading a lot. Um, then in the uh, early 2019, um, had the idea for the first thing about you. And uh, it kind of took me about seven or eight months to write that. And um, yeah, just kind of, was fortunate enough to find an agent really fast and revise with him and then the publisher. And 
um, yeah, it's been like a super interesting process. I just finished my second novel. Um, and now we're in the uh, first round of revisions for that. It is not a sequel. Um, every person I talked to is like, oh, is it going to be like a trilogy? I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, the second book, uh, to give it's still YA, um, to give a little bit of a you know, hint at it, uh, I kind of like the idea of like taking a topic from like a previous story. So like in this book, um, I don't have enough, I didn't have enough space to really dive deep into Harris's relationship with his older brother, Ollie, um, who is not disabled. And at the end, we really do see how much they love and care about each other. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to write a story about siblings where one has a disability and the other doesn't, and kind of that dynamic. Um, but then take Harris's family um, in The First Thing About You, who is really loving and supportive, and kind of flip that on its head, a total 180. So what kind of story do you have from that? Um, so that's a little bit about what the second novel is about. Great, well, we look forward to seeing that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we are gonna move on to Natalie. Natalie Lloyd is a best-selling author of middle grade novels. Um, she has lots of, lots of favorites over the years and this is her newest, um, and Natalie, I know that you have, have lots of things to say about this very personal book, um, so I'll let you talk and then we'll have a few more questions. Oh, that sounds awesome. Thank you all so much for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you, Marty and Chaz. Congratulations on your new book. I wanted to read about it since I heard about it. And David, so nice to meet you. Like I was telling you before we started, if you ever need some dialect, um, that may be a little too twangy. <laughs> I might be your girl for research. Uh, but I am so excited for my new book. It's called Hummingbird. And this is my seventh novel, which feels impossible to even say, but it all started for me back in 2014 when I wrote A Snicker of Magic. And I'm so thankful that little book found readers. I love it when I get emails from teachers or librarians and their students have still discovered it for the first time. That feels really special. And, um, you know, from that book on, there's some topics I've always loved writing about. I love writing about magic, especially magical mountain towns in the South. I love writing about people and the relationships that draw people together. Um, I like friendship. I love the wonder. I write a lot about loss because I think that's something that we all deal with that really marks our lives. And so when it came time for this book, for Hummingbird, some of those themes were still coming up. I kind of knew what I wanted to write about. I knew it was going to be this mountain town and I knew there were these mysterious woods. I decided there was this creature in the woods that grants wishes and and I knew this main character was going to go in search of it but what surprised me is when I actually pictured Olive the main character there on the cover because she looks like me by which I mean she and I have the same physical disability it's called osteogenesis imperfecta and it's a brittle bone disease and even though I had written disabled characters before and I am disabled I kind of hesitated when I wrote it. And I think there's a connection to a little bit of what Chaz was talking about. I thought, oh, I don't want this just to be disability lit. I don't want people to read this and feel sorry for her or for me, or I don't want them to read it and think she's this inspiring character just because she uses a wheelchair. And so I really had to back up and think about how to tell the story. And at first I tried to lean into all the good stuff growing up because Oh, I is hard. A little backstory. I was actually, let me do this like a story. Once upon a time on a snowy day in Kentucky, <laughs> I was born with um, a broken collarbone, which was no big deal at the time. But about 10 weeks later, my mom heard a snap when I was kicking around in my crib and I had broken my leg for the first time. So that's a whole other story because of course it's, you know, not something people see often when you take a baby, you know, to the ER because they have a broken bone. Uh, but eventually I was diagnosed with brittle bones. And I always say much like my favorite ornament on the Christmas tree, which is a glass likeness of Willie Nelson. <laughs> I break very easily. Um, when I was a kid, this was especially true. Um, I have a mild case of OI, so I'm less likely to fracture now, but my bones are still brittle. But as a kid, I used to wheelchair and walker, especially at school where people could knock me over or I could slip and fall easily. Um, so this 
was my experience. I mean, I knew I could write this, but I also thought, oh, I don't know how to write about a girl with OI, even though there's all this magic and friendship, all this wonder in her world without having a little bit of a conflict that she has with it, because that's what's true for me. So at first, when I was writing Hummingbird, I tried to kind of push all that stuff to the back. You know, here's Olive, and she is searching for her future BFF, and she loves Dolly Parton, like I do. And, you know, she's looking for this creature to grant the deepest, truest wish of her heart. She is experiencing public school for the first time in this very strange and magical school. And I loved all of that, but I didn't feel like it had a heart. And my editor kind of felt the same way. It felt like those early drafts, I was getting her voice and I liked it, but there was something missing from the story. And it took 2019, the pre pandy times, if you will, <laughs> um, and a broken leg for me to see what was up. I was walking through the kitchen late one night to check a door and I slipped in dog drool and broke my femur, which is typically the strongest bone in a human body, but my femurs are not strong. That's usually the bone that breaks. And after that, um, you know, there was surgery, there was physical therapy, I used a wheelchair for a long time, like I have periodically throughout my life, but then I remembered firsthand, oh, this is what it's like when people talk to the person pushing me, and not to me, or this is how it feels when I can't get in a building, or, you know, when people stare, because it's different, and I understand that, especially from little kids, but what surprised me the most in that season is how I felt about myself. I think I had, um, through friendships and relationships and especially books, I never felt fragile when I read a book and all of that helped me develop a truer identity that wasn't just fragile and suddenly I was fragile again. That's the word I heard all the time when I was a kid and that's how I felt. And I remember one night I was sitting beside my husband on the couch. I always say he's like Gilbert Blythe if you're an Anne of Green Gables nerd like I am. He's like Gilbert if Gilbert had sleeve tattoos and cussed just a little bit. Uh, but we were beside each other on the couch and I said, I feel so broken and I hate my body right now. And he said, you are not broken. Your leg's broken, but you're not broken. And I feel like it took that for me to realize how to find Olive's voice in this story. It had to be the whole truth of what I've experienced. And I wanted to read um, something that happened when I started writing from that very true place. Most of Hummingbird um, is prose, like the other books I've written. But um, when I started writing from that very, very true gut level, honest place in Olive's life, I noticed the verse started to break a little bit. And I think that's because when Olive um, is talking about her body, um, the words break because she sees herself as broken in the beginning of the book she does. But this is um, a little snippet of verse from chapter three called Candy Bones. Osteogenesis imperfecta. It sounds like a magic spell, if you don't know what it means. Like words you'd whisper over muddy sludge to make the wildflowers bloom like words you'd holler up at the storm to clear a path for sparkling stars. It might sound like magic, but right now, today, it feels like a curse. The curse of bones that break easy for no reason. Candy bones, glass bones, OI is the reason I'm fragile. Femur, patella, socket, tibia, fibula, more magic sounding words that are only bones, bones that are built to connect and grow and build a body. But mine weren't built right, that's what I believe. Grandpa Goad says, I'm not correct on that account, that God made us all and God don't make mistakes. But I don't understand why God made me broken. I've asked God this question plenty of times. He hasn't answered me yet. Your bones look like lace on the inside, Dr. Cass told me once. And that's the problem. If I lived in a novel, I could have bones made of lace or ribbon or icy spider webs or sharp shafts of rainbow light. But in this world, a girl needs bones made of concrete a heart made of steel. I'm 11 years old, but I already know that's true. And that's when I knew I'd figured out where it was at because disability is never an afterthought for me. It's my life. It affects every decision I make. It's part of my relationships. I, I read a quote once that I like that said disability will be the most complicated relationship you have in your life. And that's been true for me so far. Um, there are days that I roll with it literally and figuratively. And there are days that it frustrates me because it's painful and hard and frustrating. And all of that became true for Olive 
as well. So um, I'll let you get to your questions now, but I did want to say thank you, not just for inviting me to tell you about this book, but for sharing the book with people who might be interested. I think it's so important to have all kinds of bodies represented in books, all kinds of personal experiences on bookshelves. And my hope for readers who find it, one is just that they have fun with it. But if there are other middle grade readers like I was who are insecure sometimes about the body they're in, I hope it reminds them they get to take up all the space they want on this planet exactly as they are and that there are so many good days ahead. So thank you for letting me tell you a little bit about the story. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so as you're saying, you know, this is a very personal book for you. Um, were there experiences from your days in middle school that, you know, you absolutely drew from when you were writing about all of going to school? Oh, absolutely. And it's in those times I think, oh, what have I done here? Because sometimes I draw from the hard ones, like Olive has an experience early on in a cafeteria where she drops her tray, but she can't lean over to get it. Um, people kind of sit with her because they feel sorry for her, not necessarily because they want to get to know her. And I've experienced all of that. And I've experienced so much good stuff too that she experienced. Like um, Olive gets into theater. She realizes that is the place place that helps her find her wings. And it wasn't that for me, it was writing. But I do think, especially around that age, when you find one thing you love, that's kind of what helps you find your people, find your friend group, find a little bit of confidence in a very shaky season. So those things were definitely true for me. Awesome. Um, so you've written several novels, um, and some of them incorporate magic realism, just like this one. How do you get to a place where you're able to mix magic and the real world. Um, it's just, it's a fascinating blend um, and just rings really true. Oh, thank you for saying that. I'm so glad it feels true. I love it when I get letters from young readers who want to know, like in The Key to Extraordinary, my second book, there were all these magical flowers in a town. There were things called telling vines that could hold secrets for years. And, and a little reader was like, where do I see telling vines up close? And I love it that it felt real enough to actually, you know, something that he or she wanted to see. Um, because I'm like that with books I love. And for me, it's it is kind of seamless. I see a lot of magic in the world. I love books that have magic inside them. I think growing up in Appalachia, and David probably remembers this from his time, there's so much storytelling. Um, there are so many legends and stories passed down. And so it, it feels very natural to add those to a book. Plus it helps the character realize how brave they are. I think it helps them realize all the things in the world that are even better than magic. Um, so I was looking today and I saw that you narrate the audiobook um, yes. of, of Hummingbird. W tell us about that. What is that like to narrate your own book, especially one that is, you know, so personal? Oh my goodness. Well, Paul Gagne, who is over the audiobook at Scholastic, he'd been asking me to do it for a while. And I always said no, because they get these incredible voice actors to read the stories. And I didn't want young readers, especially to miss out on that. I'm not an actress, <laughs> so I didn't know how it would go. But I went into a studio. I did, you know, a little bit of practice with it to see how I felt. And I thought if I'm ever going to try it, I think this is the book to do it because it is so personal. And I had so much fun with it. Um, Every day for a week, for a few hours, I would go to this studio here in Chattanooga and we would record. I got to work with a director. I worked with a coach beforehand to try to differentiate the voices a little. So it kind of scratched that itch for theater. I always liked theater, but I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> um, but I, I love doing it. So I'm glad I got to be a part of it. Yeah, it, that'll be fun to listen to. We'll have to look for it. But I think oh, it comes out you. in October. I think it isn't out yet, right? Is that... I, I think there are physical editions, like CDs maybe, that come out in October, and it's available for download now. Oh, so. okay. Perfect. Yeah. Well, our, our audience can look for that. All right. So now I think we have some questions for everyone. Um, I have a couple. Elanita, are there questions from the audience that we want to... No? Okay. Uh, Gwen? Uh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that... Uh, obviously, you can hear me and see me okay, right? Yes. Okay, because my, um, I, I mentioned before we started, I was having some outage issues in my neighborhood. And so I blinked oh, out for a minute. So I'm actually on my cell phone right now. 
Oh, okay. Well, your timing is perfect. <laughs> yeah, my home internet is just blinked out right there. So I just want to make sure everything, you can hear me and everything. Yeah, we can. Oh, great. great. Glad to have you back. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think we have time maybe for like two questions and we'll just go around. Um, and so actually one of these things I kind of talked with Marty about already, but it's about friendship is like the most important theme in your books. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about how all of your characters, you know, kind of got over their misconceptions about the people that they meet. Cause you know, they're in, some of them are in new situations, meeting new people, um, like with Marty's, you know, you don't want to give away the ending, but the bully kind of, one of the bullies comes around a little bit. Um, and so I don't know if any of you want to talk a little bit about, about people and learning about other people and how they're different from what we first thought. Does anyone want to jump in? Yeah, I can. Thanks. Uh -huh. So yeah, in the, in the first thing about you, um, Harris talks a lot about when he lived in San Diego and he didn't have many friends, um, which is mostly his fault of just not making the effort uh, to do so. And uh, when he moves to New Jersey, he immediately uh, gets waved over to a lunch table by a boy named Xander, um, but he's kind of a year younger than him and he's really nerdy and also doesn't have any friends. So like Harris, and it's funny, to, it's not funny, but like Marty's book is about bullying. And like, in a sense, Harris is a bit of a bully in the beginning of the book, the way he judges the people around him. Um, and that's where uh, Miranda, the nurse, comes in. They kind of teach him that like, hey, you have to make the effort too. Like, um, if you want a, rel a relationship, um, you have to learn about uh, the, 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 the people around you. Um, and it doesn't come out really to the end that, his new friend Xander has some issues at home that he's dealing with. And, and that's the reason why he loves hanging out at Harris's house. And when Harris abandons him, it's kind of like this, you know, earth shattering moment to Xander. But Harris doesn't know that effect because he's never learned anything about his new friend. Um, so you kind of need other people in your life um, to kind of show you. And that's where Harris's mom and his brother and his dad come into, come into place. And, and Miranda as well, um, to kind of show that to him. Uh, well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I know uh, my my novel is, um, Hollow of the Fireflies is actually dedicated to my, my best friend, uh, who I, we've been best friends for decades now. <laughs> we met in, in back in high school. And um, I've always throughout my life really valued my friends and, you know, I'm very careful about the people that I surround myself with as far as in my very close circle of friends. And so the throughout the book, like I said, there's lots of themes, but I think the central one is about friendship and old friends and making new friends. And the, uh, the STEM camp in my novel that uh, Javari goes to is a STEM camp with children from all over the country, you know, so there's, uh, I mean, it's predominantly white uh, as far as the kids, but there's uh, one of the supporting characters is a Vietnamese American character, another one's Indian American. There's a, a boy in a, a wheelchair. Uh, so, um, and, you know, throughout, the, and of course, Cricket is the, the friend, the primary friend that my protagonist meets, who's like a local boy. And Cricket winds up kind of befriending him and also teaching him quite a bit, uh, teaching Javari quite a bit and uh, about himself and about the world too. So, so yeah, I mean, um, I think it's important to have in there, you know, it's, 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 it's so important to children, friendship, you know, when, when you're at that age, at least in middle school. And so I just really wanted to make sure that I kind of touched upon that and kind of explored that whole thing of like, of friendship what is a true friend that's uh, for me that's one of the things i love about writing for uh, middle grade readers is is they're at that age where they're, they're sort of crossing that border between you know their relationship with their their family and then their relationship with their friends right and it's it's a scary time because you're redefining who you are before 
you would be defined by your parents, your guardians, your siblings. And now like in a schoolyard, be, you're being defined by the people who you choose to be your friends or who choose to be your friend. And it's a scary time, right? Because the person you like may not necessarily like you. And I've had those moments where it's like, I like that girl. And then it's like, nope, uh, shot down, right? So it's one of those things where uh, friendship is important. It's new. It's exciting. It's scary. It's debilitating at sometimes when you realize that uh, your concept of friendship may not be somebody else's French, uh, concept of friendship. And so it is, in my mind, one of the sort of more formative experiences that we have growing up. It's, it's, it's how we learn, you know, the social skills to be able to deal with strangers. Like I, I know growing up, I was a complete introvert. And it sort of stunted a lot of my sort of interactions with people. Like if you see me at a party, I'll be the one who's standing beside the food table, hoping somebody <laughs> will come over and talk to me. And, uh, and then when they do, I latch onto them and, and they look for excuses to get away from me. So, so I think that had a lot to do with uh, sort of my, my years growing up uh, in that small town. And, and just as a side note, I, I, I gotta say, Natalie, I love, I love how, like, I love the way you're talking about your book. It's just, uh, just, I, I can see why they got you to narrate the audio book because I could listen to oh, you for thank hours. Thank you. And, and I love, I love the notion of magic. I, I can't bring you real magic, but this is the closest that I can do uh, for you right here. Oh, I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, You're like a magician. I feel like I'm in a yeah. magic show. <laughs> Uh, oh, you know, for me, when it comes to friendship in my books and Hummingbird, especially for Olive, she is in a very insulated world because she has brittle bones. Her parents have hesitated about sending her to public school, but she really wants to go. She thinks that's the only way she's going to make a best friend since nobody else in this town is homeschooled. She's kind of on her own in that. And so she loves to read. Um, she loves the idea of friends, but she doesn't really know how to make them. And she has a stepbrother whose name is Hatch. And she makes a lot of assumptions about Hatch early on based on characters she's imagined in books or just the way we all do, just those first interactions we have and those assumptions we make that turn out completely false. But she's learning for the first time how off those can be. So she's learning to... Um, get to know people for who they are, especially people in her family <laughs> or like Hatch, who's become part of her family. And um, she does meet a best friend at school too. And it's kind of fun to write about that relationship developing. They bond over Judy Bloom books and snacks. And um, that's pretty much how I bond with my friends too. So, Great. Elanita, do you think we have time for one last question? Oh. I'm muted, but yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's do one more. Um, all right. So the children's literature community, we talk a lot about how every child should see themselves in a book, mirror books. Um, and so I just wanted to ask you, was there a book growing up that was a mirror book for you that was, you know, that you're able to talk about? Whether it was, you know, kind of your own situation or, or just your, your soul book. <laughs> which you know Anna Green when you mentioned Anna Green Gables it's like oh my soul book so um yeah does anyone want to well, want to jump in uh, yeah I'll jump in I mean my um comments probably gonna seem a little odd because I, I don't know I mean I don't the 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 books the children's books that I really really adored when I was growing up were the Moomin family books by Tobey Janssen uh, and I kind of stumbled across those in a bookstore when I was very young. And, you know, she, she wrote quite a few of those books. I actually have um, a little Moomin Troll right, figure right here. <laughs> it shows you how much I love those books. But um, I think, it, you know, and for those who don't know, it's about a kind of trolls who live in this kind of um, in this Norwegian enchanted forest. But it, there was, they're also kind of very similar to kind of the A.A. A. Mill and Winnie the Pooh books as far as the philosophy that's kind of in, in, in intrinsic within them. Uh, and so I just love them because it was like this fantasy, but also at the same time, very philosophical. And uh, I really identified with those characters quite a bit, even though I'm, I hope I'm not a troll, but um, <laughs> maybe in my heart, I'm a troll. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> 
mad the magical kind of troll right <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool does someone someone else want to go I can go next. Um, I So this is a hard one for me to answer because there are so many books I loved as a kid and I imagine myself in all of them, especially the Chronicles of Narnia. I always say those are the first books I felt like I could feel what Lucy felt when she walked through the wardrobe. When it comes to seeing another disabled character in books, I don't remember seeing it, not because it didn't exist. I know people were writing them. I just didn't see them. I think the first time I saw disability, even like on a TV show I watched, and this doesn't really count, was Zach Morris playing wheelchair basketball. <laughs> so that doesn't count. Then years later in a movie, I did see a character who had OI, but he was a villain, did all these horrible things. And I mean, we're all good and bad. We want nuanced characters, but I remember thinking, why can't like, you just see disabled people falling in love and living their lives and, or in this case, having a magical adventure. So um, I'm excited to see that now. I think now we see a lot more of it in lit, especially in kid lit. And I think it's really cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would echo Natalie's sentiments, uh, sentiments in, in the sense that when I was growing up, I, I couldn't see an, an Asian character in a book. Just, I mean, I'm in a small town with a very limited library, and you just, you just didn't see uh, people of color as characters in, in some of the books. So, uh, the the book that I sort of gravitated to early on, uh, and it was just because I was an only child growing up until I was 15 and then my brother came along. So I was always fascinated with the concept of having a sibling. So so naturally I went over to thinking about the Hardy <laughs> Boys and Joe Hardy and thinking what it would be. And I mean, I like the mystery aspect of it, but I was more sort of fascinated with the idea of a relationship between two brothers and that sort of the thing that, that I was looking forward to. And then I think later on, when I was in uh, junior high, late, late middle school, uh, the the Hobbit uh, sort of came in, and and I sort of sort of created this sort of this sense of you've got elves, you've got dwarves, you've got hobbits, and they're all sort of inter uh, interconnected, and and to me it almost felt like I could be welcomed in a world like that, even though I was Chinese Canadian. Uh, so that was that would be the closest thing to to sort of a mirror mirror book for me. Oh. Thanks, Marty. Chaz, do you have have one? <laughs> um, yeah, I think kind of what Natalie said, I didn't see a lot of stories with disabled uh, characters in them. Uh, but it's funny because I don't, I don't know if I would have read them. Like that's the thing is like when I was a kid, I tried to separate myself a lot from my disability. Uh, so now that I'm older, I, I'm trying to show that you shouldn't do that. Uh, to younger people. I think the books that I connected with were the ones that uh, the characters, even if they weren't disabled, were feeling the same things I was at that time as a young person. Um, and maybe the voice that they had in it, um, interesting dialogue, those were usually the ones I was drawn to. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I just want to thank all of you for these thoughtful comments and for sharing your books with the world. And um, we really want to help you get them out there and find an audience. Um, I know that I've enjoyed all of them. Uh, and so thank you for joining us today. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you were great. And for the audience, the books will be on uh, bids as far as uh, you will be able to click through and see all of their titles and order them right away off of bids. Um, and we have webinars every once a month on Wednesday, and we're having a special one next week, actually, for Muslim Salam Reads uh, imprint, and we're really excited about that. And we just, all of you were so great. Thank you so much, and Gwen, thank you. And thank you to the sponsors, your publishers that um, recommended you come on with us. And we will be recording this and sending out the recording, and it will sit on the broadart.com YouTube as well. So thank you again. And uh, oh, we have a question. Of course, we have a question. <laughs> uh, oh, fabulous event. Thanks to the authors and Broda. You're welcome. We're really excited. <laughs> thank you. It was a pleasure and an honor to be with all of you. <laughs>